Welcome to Transformed by Grace, an in-depth Bible study of God's Word, presented by the Berean Bible Society. Join us each time on this station as Pastor Kevin brings the transforming message of God's grace revealed through the Holy Scriptures. stranded on the proverbial deserted island in the Pacific for years. One day, a boat came sailing into view and the man frantically waved and got the skipper's attention. The boat landed on the beach and the skipper got out to greet the stranded man. After a while, the rescuing sailor, he noticed three huts on the island and he asked the castaway, what are those three huts you've built? The formerly stranded man replied, well, that first hut's my house. Well, what's the next hut? asked the sailor. He, the man said, I built that for my church. Well, what about the third hut? asked the sailor. The castaway answered matter-of-factly, that's where I used to go to church. In this episode, we're going to be talking about multiple churches in the scriptures. The reason we need to is because there is more than one church spoken of in your Bibles. Acts chapter 7, verses 35 through 38 read, This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out, after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke, spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Much confusion exists today about the biblical word church. Without understanding the term in light of scripture, many people wrongly conclude this word refers to a building for worship. The Bible teaches the church is not a building. The church is believers themselves. They are the church. Others assume that any time they find the word church in the Bible, it refers to them or truth about them. But that is not true either. And this conclusion can lead to many practical and doctrinal errors. First, we need to establish the fact about the word church in the Bible that every time we find the word church, it does not always mean the same thing or the same group of people. As it is with many biblical words, it's critical to look at the context in which that word is found to understand its meaning and which group is intended by that word. The Bible refers to several different churches. First, in Acts chapter 7, we find a reference to a church, but it's not the church of today, the church, the body of Christ. It's a different church altogether. Acts chapter 7 speaks of the church in the wilderness, referring back to the days of the books of Exodus and Numbers in your Bible. So we see here that God had a church long before Christ said, On this rock I will build my church in Matthew chapter 16. But who is this church in Acts chapter 7? We see it explained here by Stephen in his discourse before the religious leaders in Israel how the people of Israel initially refused the leadership of Moses, but later they accepted and followed him out of Egypt after he showed wonders and signs. And then to Moses God gave the lively oracles on Mount Sinai to give unto Israel. Here the word church is referring to to the people of Israel as they wandered in the wilderness after their deliverance from Egypt. And what we see here is that there was a church in the past, in the wilderness, which had laws and requirements and instructions specifically for them. They had a place to worship at the tabernacle, and they had a leader, Moses, and the church was Israel, the people of Israel. When we read about this church in the Old Testament, it does not refer to us. This is not the church of this dispensation of grace. That was a different church, a different group of people. The word church is the Greek word ekklesia, and it simply means called out, 
uh, called out group or called out assembly. It's a very general term and can be used to describe any group of people from an angry mob to a group of saints gathered for worship. We see the angry mob example in Acts 19.32 where it says, Some therefore cried one thing, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together, it says in that verse. The word assembly in that verse is, is the same Greek word for church, ekklesia, that's usually translated church. But of course, that was not referring to a church in the sense that we think of a church normally. But that was a called out group. And it was referring to an angry, riotous mob of people who, who came apart, assembled together for the purpose of trying to do away with the Apostle Paul at Ephesus. But it's been rightly said, unfortunately, this verse is probably a better definition of most churches than any verse we can find. That some cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more per knew not why they were come together. So the Greek word for church we see is a very general term that can refer to both an unruly mob of unbelievers such as at Ephesus or to a group of believers. The context will always govern which church and what is being spoken of. Israel was a church, a called out group. They were called out of Egypt. They were called out of the world to be God's special people. And we today are also a called out special group of people. We are called out not as a special chosen nation as Israel was, but instead we're called out to be a part of the church, the body of Christ, the one church for this dispensation. So we too are a church, but we are not Israel. Israel is a church, but they aren't the body of Christ, and these must be kept separate. And doing this, this clarifies many misunderstandings about God's instruction for Israel under the law, and God's instruction for the body of Christ under grace. And this is rightly dividing. And when we rightly divide between these two, the Bible becomes more clearly understood. Therefore, we need, not, we need to be careful not to indiscriminately apply to ourselves the instructions or promises that God gave to a different church. In other words, which God gave to the nation of Israel. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 19 read, When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Matthew 16, we find another reference to a church, but again, this is not the church, the body of Christ. Instead, it refers to the church of the coming kingdom on the earth. Notice in verse 18, uh, it says, Upon this rock I will build my church. So we should immediately ask, what church? What called out assembly? And then as we read in its context, in the next verse we read, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven does not refer to heaven in heaven above, but to the kingdom that will come from heaven to the earth at Christ's second coming to Israel. Christ will establish a kingdom of heaven on the earth in which he will rule and reign as king over all the earth. So the church the Lord is talking about here is the earthly kingdom church. Throughout the gospel accounts, the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples went everywhere preaching the gospel of the kingdom promising that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see that in Matthew 4, 17 and chapter 10, verse 7. In this overall context, the Lord Jesus asked his disciples who people were saying that he was. They said that some were saying he was John the Baptist, and others were saying he was Elijah. Some said the prophet Jeremiah. Others said he was one of the prophets. The Lord then asked them point blank, 
but who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Our Lord's response that was that he would build his church, not on Peter, but on Peter's confession that Jesus was Israel's long-promised Messiah and King and the very Son of God. The earthly kingdom church was built on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ told Peter that thou art Peter, and the Greek word there is the word petros, meaning little rock or piece of a rock. And then he says, that upon this rock, and that word is the Greek word petra, meaning a large rock or a rock mass. And the Lord says, I will build my church. The large, massive rock was the truth of Christ and who he is as Messiah and God. By believing that the Lord Jesus Christ was Israel's promised Messiah and King and the Son of God, those who chose to believe this message were being called out as the church at that time. And that church was to go right into the earthly millennial kingdom with that as their hope. And to this church, Christ said in Luke chapter 12, Seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that you have, and give alms. The little flock Christ was speaking to was the seedling, the beginning of the earthly kingdom church. These were the charter members of this church, and Christ gave instruction to that church within his earthly ministry. We'll be returning to the program in just a minute. But first, we'd like to take this time to thank you, our partners, for making these programs possible. If you would like to access our library of helpful Bible study tools, go to BereanBibleSociety.org. Exploring the Unsearchable Riches of Christ is a hardcover 190-page book written by Pastor Paul M. Sadler. The purpose of this book is to establish the reader in God's message for the church, the body of Christ, during this present age of grace. The content of this volume has been developed over a 25-year period, and we pray it may help you enjoy the Word of God in a deeper sense. It clearly transformed this author's life when he first came to a knowledge of the Word, rightly divided. To order your copy, contact the Berean Bible Society for pricing and availability at 262-255-4750 or visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. To receive our free full-color 32-page monthly magazine, The Berean Searchlight, call 262-255-4750 or subscribe online at www.bereanbiblesociety.org. Thank you again for your generous gifts. And now, back to the teaching with Pastor Kevin. The Lord told those of His day how if a sinning brother could not be reasoned with, he tells them they should tell it unto the church in Matthew 18, 17. Tell it unto the little flock kingdom church that already existed of those who had repented, been water baptized, and believed in Christ as the Messiah and God. On the day of Pentecost, there were added about 3,000 souls, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved, Acts chapter 2 says. There was already a church in existence on the day, of Pentecost and believers were added to it. It was the kingdom church, the little flock. And at Pentecost, that church was added unto by 3,000 and it kept growing. And those at Pentecost did what the Lord told the little flock church to do in Luke chapter 12, to sell all that they had. Acts chapter 2 verse 45 says, after they believed in Christ, repented and water baptized, they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. That kingdom church is to go right into the tribulation period and then into the millennial kingdom which follows it. And in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah, gave Israel instruction for the tribulation period, for the earthly millennial king, kingdom within his earthly ministry. He, he taught them how the church was to live, how they were to serve and operate during those time periods of the tribulation and the millennial kingdom. He gave them instructions such as the need to forgive others in order to be forgiven. Because within the tribulation period, as a result of the Antichrist hatred, believers in Christ will be persecuted in that day, and God requires forgiveness. He requires of them to forgive those that persecute them for their sins to be forgiven. Christ told his church of the need to take no thought for the morrow or about providing for their daily needs, but to trust God to supernaturally provide for them. Christ will do that for Israel in the tribulation when they are unable to buy and sell without taking the mark of the beast. Christ taught Israel the need to forsake father, mother, brother, sister, spouses. They, because if, they, if those family members take the mark of the beast, they'll have to forsake those family members and follow the Lord. So they are not tempted to take the mark of the beast as well. Christ spoke of the mysteries of the kingdom. He talked about things regarding the kingdom on earth that God had never said before until the Lord Jesus Christ revealed it to the nation of Israel. In the Gospels, Christ gave instruction meant for Israel, meant for the kingdom church, not meant for the church, the body of Christ. Our eternal hope and the instructions for about how Christ would have us live and serve and operate today are distinctly different from that of the kingdom church. And we see that with these things that today we don't forgive in order to be forgiven. We forgive others because we already are forgiven in Christ. All our sins are gone the moment we trust Christ as our Savior. Today we do need to take thought about providing for our daily needs and work to provide for them or we'll be hungry, thirsty, homeless, and cold. Today, we're not to forsake family. We're to care for our family, meet their needs, be there for each other always. Paul says that we're worse than an infidel if we don't provide for our own in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Today, we don't live by the mysteries of the earthly kingdom, but by the revelation of the mystery committed to the apostle Paul, which reveals our heavenly hope and walk for the body of Christ today. Instruction for how to live through the tribulation does not pertain to us, the body of Christ, because we won't be here during the tribulation. We are delivered from the wrath to come, and we have the hope, the sure hope, of the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, the body of Christ. After Israel rejected the ministry of the Holy Spirit in early Acts, God temporarily set the nation of Israel aside in her unbelief. He has this delayed the tribulation. He has delayed his kingdom. And he brought in the dispensation of the grace of God. God will have a called out group of people, a church, after this present dispensation has been brought to an end after the rapture. It will be an earthly kingdom church. And God's going to pick up where he left off with Israel's program. And there will be a kingdom church reestablished of believing kingdom saints that exists during the tribulation and the millennial kingdom when Christ comes as king to reign over the people of Israel and over the people of the whole world. We see that also by the seven churches at the beginning of the book of Revelation, which are seven local assemblies in Asia that are part of the greater kingdom church. And the kingdom church in that day, they are going to turn to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they're going to turn to Hebrews through Revelation for their instruction for how to live during those times. Therefore, when reading those sections of the Bible, we must not indiscriminately apply instructions or promises to ourselves that were intended specifically for a different church, the kingdom church. And it was for a different time, and it's not for us today. 
we need to carefully distinguish between the churches mentioned in the Bible. In the Old Testament, you find a church, a church in the wilderness, the nation of Israel, which is different from the church of today. In the Gospels, you find a church, a kingdom church, which is different from today. And then in Paul's epistles, you find a church, a church which is for today. Paul calls it the one new man in Ephesians chapter 2 and explains how that's, it's made up of Jew and Gentile in one body. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16 says, For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both, that is Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body by the cross. The word new there for one new man means previously unheard of, unlike anything existing before. And so it is with the church of today, the body of Christ. It was totally unheard of, never mentioned before anywhere in God's Word. Only the Apostle Paul reveals it. And only Paul reveals it because Christ revealed it directly to Paul alone in giving him the revelation of the mystery, which had been kept secret since the world began. The one new man is made up of new men and new women, new boys and new girls who are new creations in Christ, who are made new in Christ and are all one in Him and members of the one body who have been reconciled to God by the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul says here to the church, the body of Christ, he was made a minister. And this was so according to the dispensation of God which was given to him, the divine administration which had been given to Paul, which revealed the unique church of this dispensation of grace, the body of Christ. This dispensation of grace fulfills the word of God, Paul says there. It completed the divine revelation. To Paul was given the revelation which makes full or completes God's word. This revelation gives us his plan for the heavenlies, for a people to rule and reign in Christ over the heavenlies forever and ever, and that is the church, the body of Christ. This was a revelation given exclusively to Paul as God's apostle under grace for him to take with authority as his apostle to, and to reveal it to the world. And that revelation that he gave to him was the mystery, it says there. Paul makes two claims here. First, that the mystery had been given to him, and second, that this truth had been hid from ages and from generations past. And this distinct truth reveals Christ's heavenly ministry, and it reveals the truth of the church for today, the body of Christ, and God's will for that church under grace. This mystery, this secret truth revealed to Paul is no longer a secret. It's now, as he says, they're made manifest to his saints. And now all need to know about it as it reveals the glory of the cross. It reveals what God's doing today under grace and how God is working through the church, the body of Christ, to reach the world with his saving gospel of the grace of God. Ephesians 1, 22 to 23 says, And hath put all things under his, or Christ's feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Colossians 1, 18 says, And Christ is the head of the body, the church. The mystery reveals that the church for today is the body of Christ, and it reveals a new office for the Lord Jesus Christ, which had never been before revealed, as the head of the church, the body of Christ. The church, the body of Christ, is a living organism, a body of believers and members who are in living relation and union with our living head who are subject to him. We derive our life from him and we operate through his strength and power. And this church is the one that exists and operates today, right now in God's program. Within this dispensation of grace, only believers from this present dispensation are made a part of this spiritual organism, the body of Christ. For the church, the body of Christ, Paul is our apostle. He is the one apostle of this dispensation of grace. And we get our instruction 
from his letters for how the church is to live and serve and reach out and function under grace. Through the message given to Paul by Christ, he reveals to us Christ's will in the walk that our Lord desires for his church, the body of Christ today. And we find through Paul how we become members of the church, the body of Christ. And it's by grace, through faith alone, in Christ. It is by the gospel of the grace of God that we are saved, that we are made members of the body of Christ. We are saved from hell. We are placed into the body of Christ, sealed there for eternity, simply by believing that Christ died for our sins and rose again. The whole Bible was written for our learning, Romans 15, 4 says, and we should never neglect the rest of God's Word. There are principles and truths throughout the Word of God that are horizontal truths for our edification and learning and spiritual growth in Christ. It is all for us, but the Bible is not all written directly to us. The section of the Bible that contains our direct promises instructions and doctrine for application by the church today is found in the letters of Paul, Romans through Philemon. That is our mail for today. For our lives to be transformed by grace, we need to read, study, learn, grow, and apply God's grace instruction for His church under grace found in the letters of Paul. If you're not receiving our free 32-page full-color monthly Bible study magazine called the Berean Searchlight, be sure to contact us at Berean Bible Society to sign up. The magazine contains articles to help you in your Christian walk and to aid you in your understanding of the Bible rightly divided. It also contains announcements about our Bible conferences, advertisements for our literature, and a question box each month dealing with difficult questions from God's Word. You can sign up to receive either a hard copy of the magazine or an email notification for when it is posted on our website and available to read online. To sign up, just visit our website at BereanBibleSociety.org or you can give us a call at 262-255-4750. Thank you for watching Transformed by Grace. Thank you again for tuning in to Transformed by Grace. We appreciate your prayer support and the financial gifts. The purpose and mission of the Berean Bible Society is to help you understand the whole counsel of the Word of God. For more information, visit our website at www.bereanbiblesociety.org or give us a call at 262-255-4750. Or if you prefer, write us at the Berean Bible Society, P.O. Box 756, Germantown, Wisconsin, 53022. Now until next time, may you be transformed by God's grace.